the transforming power of Almighty God that can take clay and breathe the breath of life into it, which is that thing, with the first sound that Adam would have made breathe out the name of the most holy God. Wow. And that interests me. That I am interested in that kind of power. And that word said he became a living soul. That word living in that context by NG on the end, which is a Jerry word means living and living and living and living and living. And never died. Had sin not come upon the on the earth. Adam and Eve would still be living today. Amen. Would still be 21 years old. I believe that. Still be perfect. Amen. Well, then it's just ran through the scripture because it has to run in continuity through the Bible. And so I just, you could talk, you could just go to when Jesus breathed on the apostles. He, he said that same word, that inhale. And he said, receive me the Holy Ghost, and they did. And you could go over to Mary when she met Elizabeth. And that baby had not moved, and Elizabeth said that. And Mary said, and I'm going to have a child, and his name is And John the Baptist heard that voice saying that sound and weeped in his mother's wow. womb and received the Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And that may be enough of it that you get a picture. But that's why that water baptism Amen. Amen. It has to be in that name, yes. not in the titles. Now, the titles are true. They are true titles, but they do not contain the breath of life. So, the Lord bless you. That's just the Praise the Lord. Lord. If you run that through the Bible, you find that it's in simplicity, it runs continuity through the Bible, and, uh, and it's simple. Yes, it is. Right. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Our heads and pray. Almighty God, offer a blind giver of every good gift. We thank you today that you have promised to be with us. We ask that you will do that if there is a need today. And some of them I couldn't understand, but if there are needs, Father, I ask thee now that you will meet those needs. In the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the author of life.
just come get me with your gospel. Speak to us today. Yes. Let us apply it, Lord. Give us more strength for the fight, Lord. More and more courage, Lord, to grab that sword harder than ever before and get to work like we're supposed to. Lord. Don't let us be lazy. Don't let us be lax. Don't let us get distracted. Let us focus, Lord God. For the time is at hand and the time is now. We love you. Speak to us. Draw us close to and pray. And we will be sure, Lord, to give you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. There is truth none like you, Lord Jesus. Amen. God bless you this morning. Welcome, welcome, welcome. While you're standing, you'll turn to Acts chapter 14. And glad to see you all out in the house of the Lord today. Brother Doug, God bless you. Glad to see you today. This is your son. It's a privilege. He's been such a blessing to this assembly. We miss her terribly. God is merciful. God is with her. He spared her. Yes, sir. I appreciate his grace. Yes. Yeah. I just want to read two verses before I have you seated today. Acts chapter 14, <coughs> verses 19 and 20. This will be part three and serve the living God. Acts chapter 19, 14. I'm sorry, chapter 14, verses <coughs> 19 and 20. <coughs> and there came thither <coughs> certain Jews. You see, that's italicized. Certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Another way to say that is they drug his body to the edge of town. They beat him so bad, they, this is dead man, we did our job, we just dragged the corpse to the edge of the city, supposing, supposing that he was dead, he had been dead. How be it? I love the scripture in the sense that it uses words like how be it, heretofore, and whatsoever, and different things like that. Because you think about what changed with this word. There's a very good chance he was there. Right. There's a good chance. Right. There was a very good chance, but God wasn't done with it. Right. So how be it, come? How be it? As the disciples stood around the valley, he rose up and came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. God bless you. You can be seated this morning. Because it doesn't say that, that he, uh, he, he rose up from the grave and said, you know what, I need just a few days off. I need to take a vacation. I'm going right. pretty bad. I'm going to take a break. And I'm not going to some feathers. I should just kill a bullet for a while. Right. You didn't read that, did you? No. You, you got to write the word. Yes, sir. Can you imagine? It's easy. I say it's easy. It's hard enough to serve the Lord in a well life. Right. Yeah. When everything's going good, when they when everything's going good and everything's fine and, and all these things you just apply together, it's hard enough because you've got all the demonic depression of discouragement and depression, all those things, just in the spiritual warfare. But what about when your body is weak and you're tired and you're wore out, much less than beat beyond uh, recognition of even look like a human? You've seen how he described how it had been done. And, you know, he said, give me a minute to glory. He said, not that I would glory myself. Let me show you what God has delivered me from. I've been shipwrecked. I've been floating in the sea as a dead man. I've been beaten 39 times. Over and over and over, just nonstop for the gospel's sake. Nonstop for the gospel's sake. Flip over chapter 17, that same book, <clears throat> Acts chapter 17, verse 16. I want to say I really appreciate the sermon of Doug and Brian bought on Wednesday night. And what God is, and I said, and I, I do mean that I, I, I enjoy what God has done in His ministry and for the man's ministry. These men, I'm not totally different things that I've been praying about and what God has been doing with me about, but He brings it right to them to speak. Right. That is very encouraging to me. Right. I know it's because they don't know what I pray. They don't know what I think, but there's someone that does. Sure. And God has vessels that He will step in and speak through. Right. And confirm his word. Chapter 17, verse 16. <clears throat> Remember, serve the living God. Serve the living God. Not a dead God. Not a statue. Not a piece of wood. Not a piece of clay. Not a, not a job. Not a home. Not money. Not a car. None of those things. Chapter 16. Now while Paul waited for them in Athens, his spirit was stirred in him. His spirit was stirred in when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Holy, not just you know, we see a little seeds of doubt creeping in, but all of them were given to worshiping false gods, things that were not real, things that were made by hands. You'll, you'll, you'll look at this when we get into it. Verse 17, therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with them. Not just in church, but in the market. Right. Not just in church, but in the market. Well, that's probably not the time or the place. I would guarantee you, if they had an option, if they're on their way to hell, and they're in the line for hell, and they would have an 
and call his brethren, and they all come back with these long lists of excuses. I bought a piece of land. I married a wife. I've done all these things. I cannot come. And he told his servant, the servant to go on the highways and the byways and compel them. Yeah, that's right. Compel them. Leave that with Mark 16. Go in all the world. Amen. In the market daily with him that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and the Stoics encountered him. Encountered him. They come to talk. They want to see what he's going to say. Some said, what will this babbler say? That's not a good way to hear anything. You got nothing to say. You're just running your mouth. You're just a con man. You're just, you're just rattling on, rattling all these other things. You got nothing for me. What will this babbler say? Other some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods. Now this is the verse that's very interesting. He seems to be a setter forth of strange gods. This is a, a country, this is a town, that's all they do is worship something that's not real. That's all they do. That's all they do. There's nothing real about the things they put in their pocket, the things they put on their shelf. Nothing real whatsoever. It's dead. It's not alive. It can't do anything. Remember, this is 2,000 years ago, right. but it's the same devil. Right. The same devil had no problem tricking you and trying to, try to get you to think something that's not true. Right. <clears throat> they said he seems to be a setter forth of strange gods. Right. And they went ahead and lowercase g that. Because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. So verse 19, they took him and brought him into Arabic, saying, May we know what this new doctrine where thou speakest is. For thou bringest certain strange things. Again, new doctrine. This, we, this new doctrine. We know what this new doctrine is. The one that created heaven and earth, the one that created her body. We want to know about this, this new thing you thought of, this, this will, this, this idea that comes in your head, and, and you just come up with it on your own, right? About there's an eternal great creator God and, and he comes and dwells in human flesh and they call his name Jesus. That's this, this new thing, right? That's what it's a devil. For they bring a certain strange thing. <clears throat> now bring a certain strange things to our ears. We would know therefore what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear something new. Then, verse 22, Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you're too superstitious. What to say that is? You're too religious. Too superstitious. Too religious. Religion kills. Right. Religion is a covering on the flesh. The covering on the flesh doesn't do anything on the inside. Right. Amen. The atonement that was made with the, the badger skin, the animal skin that the Lord Jesus killed for Adam and Eve, and he put all of all it did was cover them. It didn't cleanse them within. It was just a religion. They put on to cover them as they walked outside. But when the light came, they didn't need that moment. Right? right? Acts 1 and 2, when he came, he didn't need that anymore. Not that he didn't need clothes. We're talking about the difference between, let's just put this on. For example, <clears throat> Brother Ram would talk a lot about, are you a Christian? He'd ask someone, are you a Christian? The first thing out of their mouth is, I'm a Methodist. I'm a Baptist. I'm a Pentecostal. And today you have, I'm a Messiah believer. Right. Just like I'm a Messiah believer. That's it. And he would ask you today. That don't mean anything. Exactly right. That don't mean anything. No, no, no. I don't care what you were born in. I don't care about that. I don't know what life lives inside. Exactly right. Exactly. See, I believe God sent a prophet. I believe that message is the vindicator of God. No dispute that whatsoever. But too many people take that and put it on and walk away and look at me and look down at you. Right. That's not what the life of Christ is. No. It's not a mantle like that. It's a mark, as our brother said. It's, like, it's a mark on you. Even when someone's not around, you're still acting that way. Even when someone can't see you or know what you're doing, you're still acting that way. It doesn't matter who's there, because you live your life knowing that I come to God, that He is God. He knows every part of me. He knows every thought I think, and I live pure before Him. I'm not trying to please you. I'm not trying to please them. I'm only trying to please Him. In our worship services, we don't come here today to see how good each other seems, how good each other, what kind of clothes you wear, while you look in service, you have your eyes closed. I only come to worship Him. Right. Now, in the aspect of that, Satan is after you not stop. Well, what's your neighbor doing? What's this going on? What happens outside? I thought about sitting back before service. <clears throat> how many times something shiny or flashy just from that area kept shining my eyes with my eyes closed? I'm like, there's nothing over there. But every now and then something just flash and trying to catch my attention. That's just the devil. Exactly. He's trying to distract you. Right. He, again, we were talking this other day about the power of prayer. Get off my notes here. The power of prayer. 
is the most powerful weapon ever put in the hand of man. Do you believe that? The most powerful ever put in the hand of man. Satan cannot stand before your prayers. Can't do it. Do you agree? Amen. 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 Did you agree? No, he cannot stand. When the weakest of all Christians go to their knees, all of hell gets scared. Amen. All of hell gets scared. So, as we said, if you're in a fight with someone, just if you're in a hand to hand fight with someone and you've got a pistol on your hip, think about that. If you're fighting someone, I'll say this if you're fighting someone and you don't have a weapon, you're hand to hand fight, they've got a pistol on the hip, you don't want that gun coming out. You'll do anything in this world to keep that gun from coming out. Anything. If you've got to sit there and do a break dance in front of them, if you've got to look bar at anything whatsoever, and I say that, but he ain't got no problem looking silly. Pop up the dumbest little thing to distract you. Well, no, I was going to spend 30 minutes in prayer this morning, and I was going to read my Bible, and all of a sudden, now this pops up, that pops up, my shoe broke, my shirt don't fit, feet behind, all these things. And now, I don't have that time to pray anymore. Where did that go? Right. And that just 30 minutes jumps to an hour, jumps to two hours, jumps to the whole day. And he's after every second of your day just right. like that. To yeah. keep you from yeah. spending time in prayer. Yeah. yeah. He can't take you and pray. Right. The righteous, fervent prayer of a righteous, the fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous man avails much. Mm -hmm. It avails much. <laughs> then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, You men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotion, I found an altar with this inscription. And it said what it said to the unknown God. To the unknown God. And they, you notice they had it capitalized. To the unknown God. You know, they, Brother Brown would say a lot of times when they come to America, the English come to America with the Spanish, they found the, <clears throat> the American Indians, they were worshiping the moon, the sun, the wind, all these different things because they know that it doesn't just move on its own. They were smart enough, even though they would be considered natives, or primitive, or very simple, on those eyes, they would know that when the wind would move, it wouldn't always come the same way. Yeah. You think about that, if you're a smart person, and I think that the wind blows in a certain path, it should always, if you figured it out, it comes through two times this way, it's going to blow right between me. Every time. If the sun moves the same way, the earth moves the same way, you understand? So it should be the same way every time. It's not. It's diverse. You have a God of variety. So how come it doesn't go back to the same spot every time? Why does it move around? It's a God of variety. But it's the same God moving it. Yeah. It's the same breath of God. It's still him moving upon it. There's no coincidence that he told Nicodemus, asking that question, where'd that wind come from? Right. You understand that? And Nicodemus is like, hmm, I never thought about wind. What do you mean about wind? All of nature, all of nature testifies to the glory of God. Keep that sentence in your mind. All of nature, when he was reading the early about the breath of God, even people that spend their entire life as idolaters or purely atheists, they must come in the world reading that, they must go out of the world reading that. All for nature, we're born from the dust, you must declare the glory of God. So you think about people all their life, and for example, the infidel, when I met there in Kentucky, that was in his seventies. I've been an atheist his entire life. I've lived in these woods, he told me, all my life, and have never seen God. And all this man had to do was pick up an apple. That's all he had to do was pick an apple. So you've lived here 70 years, and you've never seen God. That's right, that's right. I think you've probably preached a bark up the wrong tree, which means they're lying. See, the problem is, most of the ones that you hear, they're not talking about the same God. They might call him Jesus. But it's not the same God. Right. Right. You understand? Yeah. But we're going to get over to first teens in a minute. You know, let's go ahead and get that. Let me lay that for a background. <clears throat> first teens chapter 18. This was my purpose that the Lord is leading to, to get to this. And I thought we would start with it, but, it, but it's not the way we had to go. First teens chapter 18. Now you understand that the first time, I think it's just a chapter before, it introduces Elijah. And if you remember the uh, very first scene, the voice of God ever put on uh, the very first message that I know of, I, I may be wrong with that, that they put on the CD, it was free, and it was given 
way of the normal tapes, you see these, was the message, these serve the God. Right. I've heard it see these so many times, it won't come out. But I quote it to you. That's right. So again, that's where you have verse 17. <laughs> it starts right there. He just shows up out of nowhere. This man just shows up out of nowhere. And he know you have no record before or after about a tish fight. No, no record whatsoever. This man just shows up. This Elijah prophet just shows up out of middle of nowhere. There was nothing prophesied about him. Right. But he shows up and does this. So anyway, and then all this is because of, of, of Ahab in his life not truly believing Jehovah was God. Realize that. That's, what, that's how Jezebel had success. Right. If he would have met Jezebel and maybe even been tempted in the flesh, as an unnatural man would be, this might be a, an attractive woman. <clears throat> She's dressed a certain way, and, and maybe she appealed to his flesh. If he have still really had a good revelation that God was God, he would have never listened to what she said. He would have said, yes, I, you know, I, I struggle in this area, and I think these things right here, but, but what you're saying is not true. I can prove to you that he's real. Right. And it was only one. I can prove it. <clears throat> but he didn't have that saying. He, his heart had been turned away. He was never convinced. He himself was never convinced of what God really was. Right. <clears throat> Excuse me. So verse eight, chapter 18, verse 21. Elijah had done prophesied the three-year uh, famine. Uh, into the drought in the ground, there was no force brought on the famine. There were no cows. There was no place to graze. And now in this place, what you found that, that God, that uh, uh, Ahab, the temple of Adiah, to help both of them go one way, they all go the other way, looking for green grass to help save the animal because of the drought. And think about that. You read through those so quickly, you think about drought and famine, you don't understand unless you've raised animals that they got to have grass to eat. Right. So if there's no water, no grass is growing. So to say that there's going to be a no rain upon this ground, rain or dew, for three years, that is very serious. Right. That is death everywhere you look. Right. Everywhere you look, the drought, famine. <clears throat> but that's what had happened. It had been done because of Ahab and the sin that he brought upon, his, upon the people of Israel. It's so easy that, uh, and you take, you have a king of Israel, right here, you have a leader in this section, and you have a leader that because of things that he had done had brought this drought and famine upon his people. Things that he had done. You understand? This wasn't Jezebel being judged. This is what Ahab had done. Ahab did not have to listen. He did not have to follow. He didn't have to do what she said. He didn't have to partake of those strange gods. He didn't have to, but he did. And so because of what he did, now this famine, this curse, this, this drought had been brought upon the kingdom. No different than a husband with his family. No difference. Bring a curse upon your family. Go to some mistake you made. Something you've done. It's just, it's easy, well, that's just a king, and God just said to him, no, God is God. Right. God is God, and God is very serious. You're not going to get away with nothing. Uh, the scripture says God is not mocked. Right. He is not mocked. Right. And you know, if that's what you sow, you will reap. Yeah. He's not mocked. Well, you know, he didn't really care about that. He didn't really care. No, no, his word says something. It's the truth. Right. Nothing else matters. It's right. what his word says is true. It don't care what we think. I don't right. care what your daddy said, what your mama said, grandpa. It don't matter what anybody said. All that matters is what the word says because that is the breath of God. Amen. Right. 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 It's the only thing that's true. Right. Heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will never pass away. Right. <laughs> I heard a brother say this reason. I'll throw this in there. And he made a situation like this. And I loved it. I love it. I was going to use it a lot. If a man. They could not lie. If a man that could not lie ever made you a promise, would you believe it? Amen. If a man that made you a promise that could not lie, would you believe it? Right. See, God is not a man. God is, he, he, he moves in the in the, uh, the parameter of his word. I don't want the will of God for my life. Read his word. Well, that doesn't say Samuel Mark Parker who lives it. No, it's promised done to you. Right. It's promised done to you. Well, could it be my kid? It's under you and your children and your children's children. And okay, I guess that's it. It just stops with my great grandkids. No, no, no. As many as far off as the Lord our God should call. That's it, yeah. Well, I thought it was supposed to be just me and my four. I thought the door was closed. I thought it was just this. No, that's the, right. that's the mind of man. Right. That's not the mind of God. Right. God would that none would be lost. He would that none would be lost. Well, I thought it was just the message of believers. I thought it was just this. And, and that only the message of believers would take a rapture. I think that if you're 
message believer today, then, then you won't take the rapture when it happens. You might not be a message believer today, but God is still God. Amen. You might be one tomorrow. Right. Yeah. But God is the one that determines that, not you. Yeah. He's the one that determines that, not you. You're not walking along, well, God, I'm not really, uh, I'm comfortable with the Baptist, I'm comfortable with the Pentecostal, I'm comfortable with the Baptist, and, but I think before the change, I must be something else. No, oh, God, He chose you. Right. Yeah. He chose you. And He said, My child is this. Right. Yeah. This didn't happen the day you were born. This didn't happen the day you were saved. This didn't happen the day you were giving your heart to the Lord. This didn't happen in the days that you surrendered more and more and more. This was determined before the foundation. Right. He's not like, oh my goodness, they're starting to get closer. Write the name in quickly. Write the name in quickly. No. He's got faith too, you know. Right. He's got faith too. I said it. It's going to happen. Right. Yeah. It's going to happen. Sure. So the Bible says the eyes of the Lord run to and fro upon the earth, looking for someone to believe that promise. So how much faith can be released in your life? Right. How much faith can be released? <clears throat> so, back to where we started. <clears throat> Verse 21. And Elijah <clears throat> had came unto all the people and said, How long halt you between two opinions? How long halt you between two opinions? And I'll pause right there just a minute to say this. When Ahab met him, three years after the, 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 the curse had been pronounced, he told him, are you the one that troubles Israel? That's how he had greeted Elijah. Are you the one that troubles Israel? And Elijah says, not so. It was you. And he's up on his mind. Because he's been searching everywhere for three years for this man that brought this curse on so he would take the curse off. He just searched everywhere. You find that in that same chapter. Obadiah told me, he said, you, you want me to just go tell you here. That's what you want me to tell you. He said, you want me there? Obadiah says, you want me dead. That's what you want. He said, that I'll, I'll go tell him the Spirit of the Lord is grabbed you and take you somewhere else, and then I'm dead. I'm dead. He said, he has searched everywhere for three years looking for you. And you're just going to throw me out like that. He said, don't worry, I'll be right here. So he goes tells King Ahab. King Ahab comes back. Are you the one that troubles Israel? Keep that in mind as we read this verse. Elijah come unto all the people. Ahab was standing there too. <clears throat> How long halt you between two opinions? That question mark. The word of God is supernatural. The word of God does not age. The word of God does not change. That question floats there today for you as well, sitting here this morning. How long will you sit between two opinions? Right. Is he real? Is he not real? Is he for me or is he not for me? Is he my God or is he not my God? Right. Choose you this day. Choose you this day. Let him change your life. Right. <laughs> if the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, not a word. I can't imagine what it felt like. Because you know, if you've ever been around a man that's anointed, you can feel it. And there was probably something, I think about that, those 300, 300 ministers that coming in from the ground in Chicago about the baptism in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, I'll take my Bible and I'll read to you where it says baptism in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you want to disprove it, come down here with your Bible, not your book of creeds, not your church's idea, with your Bible and disprove it. Right. He said, they didn't move. He said, they were scared of the angel. They were a lot smarter than I expected them to be. <laughs> he said, they were scared of the angel. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let them therefore give us two bullets, let them choose one bullet for themselves, cut it in pieces, lay it on wood, put no fire under, and I will dress the other bullet, lay it on wood, and put no fire under. And call ye on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God that answered my fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, It is well spoken. And Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose you one bullet for yourselves and dress it first. For your many, and call on the name of your little gene, gods, but put no fire on it. And they took the bullet which was given them, they dressed it, and called on the name of Baal from morning even until noon. <clears throat> whether that was six hours, whether they started at 6 a.m. and went till noon, Whatever it was, it was the biggest waste of time this word of the Bible. Yep. From morning to noon. Biggest waste of time. Because he's not real. Right. There's only one. There's only one 
one Lord. There's only one God. He's the one that answers by fire. They took the boy. <coughs> I read that. <coughs> they came unto him on the moon saying, O Baal, hear it. But there was no voice. It's interesting. There was no voice, nor any that answered. There was no voice, nor any that answered. There was no voice, nor any that answered. See, Romans 10, 13 says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Yep. Too many people, even the message, too many people, and I say that just to make you real current, because a lot of people get the focus of the message, and you do the same, so well, I'm a message believer, and that's it. That's it. No, no movement of life, no fruit of the Spirit, none of those things, and you wouldn't even want to be around them. Right. But God moves in a person's life if you'll let him. He will change your life if you let him. He won't let you stay stagnant. He won't let you stay the way you are. He is constantly changing here a little, there a little, here a little, there a little. And too many people will get bound down in some thought or idea or something that just traps them. And they'll think, well, I'm taught that this is the only thing that's true. And they never realize it never, God never moved in. See, God is a consuming fire. Elijah teaches you right there the God that answers my fire. He did not tell them the God that blows the wind, the God that, you know, there's something that falls over, none of those things because God has done, but he said he answered by fire. See, that's an interesting way he would describe him because he does not take on over before the ark of the covenant. He does that. He does come before Elijah in on the mountain as a wind, as a storm, as a storm. He does that. But when he describes him here, he said the one that answered by fire. So I say that to say this. <clears throat> Satan has no problem letting you get into a church and that, that, that you'll say that I am this as long as there's no move of the Spirit. He has no problem with that. But I believe the message. When's the last time you felt the Lord move? Well, it's not all I do. I'm not disputing that because Satan can manifest, he can manufacture, or he can uh, reproduce anything like that to make you think that. I'm not disputing that because you always have one thought or the other way, but there is a balance. There is a balance. Satan can impersonate any gift of God. I'm not disputing that. But the Bible taught you that overseas, <clears throat> they've had they've seen pencils write an unknown tongue to self and float, and as soon as they're writing an unknown tongue, they turn around and interpret it in the language you can read. No one touches the pencil. Satan can impersonate that. I'm not disputing that. But God does move you through those gifts of the Spirit. God does move to where that you, in your human form, can feel him and know him. He does. They wasted all this time. They wasted all that time. You know, putting their all their hopes and all their thoughts. They, they sunk everything in this name of Baal, trying to hope and thinking that this will do what they needed done. Too many people will get into a job. They'll have a job, and they'll have given their life to that job, and they'll, uh, they'll have bills come up, and they'll start falling behind, and they'll think, I need to work for it. I need to do this. Now, I'm not disputing against working, because a Christian should work. There should not be one lazy Christian. I'm not disputing that whatsoever. I heard somebody um, kind of make this, you know, propose this thought recently, that most churches will never suffer a drunk man to come into it, an actual liquor drunk man. They wouldn't suffer a drunk man. Wouldn't suffer a drunk man for nothing, but they'll let a lazy person sit in the pew all the time and say nothing about it. Won't do nothing for the Lord, won't do nothing for the people, won't do nothing whatsoever. Let a lazy person sit there. See, that's not God. Right. That's not God. You cannot be a lazy Christian. That's an oxymoron. Those two things are not real. Right. One is real, one's the devil. One is God, one's the devil. You understand? When Satan's got no problem that you think that you're okay, but they're not okay. So a lot of folks will get into that with their, I must make more money, I must do this, I must do this, and they'll stack all of their life because what is an idol? It's anything you give time to, you give your attention to. I don't mean give time. Anything you'll give attention to and you'll put it between you and God. That's what an idol is. You'll put that between you and God. Now again, the negative part, Satan will come on and say, well, you've got bills to pay, you've got fees to pay, you've got to work. Again, he's got no problem twisting any thought coming at you. But, Word of God says, my God shall supply all of my need according to his riches and glory. Right. That's what he said. <laughs> so the same God, if you meet his word, if you do what he says and his requirements, it don't matter if you work 30 hours or 100 hours, he will still meet your need. <clears throat> How do I know this? Because someone who cannot lie said this. Someone who cannot lie 
See, they put all of their hopes and everything in the veil. They needed something. They wanted to see if God, their God was real. And they cried and cried and cried. But there was no voice nor any that answered. So they left upon the altar that was made, which was made. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah started mocking them. Elijah mocked them and said, cry aloud, for he is a God. And either he's talking, or he's pursuing, or he's in a journey, or peradventure he's sleeping and must be awake. They cried aloud, and they cut themselves after their manner. They cut themselves after their manner. Wait a minute, that's, again, a weird way to describe something. It's your typical manner to cut yourself. You read that too? After their manner. <laughs> You remember that Brother Brown had told about a uh, about a guy that had put on the radio or the newspaper that I can that, that, that divine healing is not true, that it's not real, and that you can't bring any proof of this. But if you could bring proof, I think they said I'd give you five hundred dollar reward or something like that. So he got several people and their doctors to go down there to them and to show them, well, these people have doctors' proof that they were healed from death. And the man said, Well, you know, I don't have the money here that you can't be, you know, I don't have the money here. Gotta go back to headquarters. That's where the money said. Well, these people couldn't travel. They couldn't travel to poor people. So he told him, so what we'll do, if your if your proof and your evidence can't travel with you when we get to headquarters, this is what the man offered. This is what he offered. He said, Well, take a little girl and cut her. And if you heal her before us, we'll know that the divine healing is real. This wasn't a Satan worship. This was something for the best man of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he offered his first thought in his head to pop up. We'll take a little girl and we'll cut her. So you can trace it all the way back to right here. Right. As was their manner. But they claim to be Christians. But they don't look like them. But nothing like it. See, Christ it, it, it is not, it's not a name on a book. It's not a name on a letter. It's not a creed. It's not a form. It's not a fashion. It's a life. And he changes you from what you used to be because you're working toward a life change. And you can't jump. You, you won't jump from a, a wretched, filthy sinner right into a perfect body. It's a here a little, there a little, changing daily. So Elijah started mocking. And so he, he got them and worked up in such a fervor. They were screaming out. They were screaming and they cut themselves <clears throat> after their manner with knives and lances till the blood gushed out upon them. That's a deep cut. That's a really deep cut. It doesn't say dripped. It doesn't say a pinprick. Lance so deep that the blood gushed. Gushed. What's the chance that some of these men died in the process? What's the chance that they started sacrificing each other, spraying that blood upon that altar? They're out of their mind, literally out of their mind. And it came to pass when midday was passed, and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. But again, italicized, there was. There was neither voice nor any to answer, nor any that regarded. See, it's different than saying that nobody responded. But he didn't answer you back. Didn't even regard it. Didn't even care. Didn't even talk. You could have at least responded. You could have at least that. He don't care. Because he ain't real. He ain't real. But I thought he would at least regard me. I've served him all this time. I've given up. I've even sacrificed all my kids to him. And why? Do you understand? The veil, anything. They sacrifice kids. They're still sacrificing kids. All these years later, still sacrificing kids. Do you think Satan never changed? No, no. Never changed. <laughs> there was none that regarded. And Elijah said to all the people, Come near unto me. And things are about to get very real. You come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. Actually, listen. And he repaired. The altar of the Lord, again italicized, that was broken down. He repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. He repaired the altar. This is the first Elijah, the first use of that spirit. The fourth use of that spirit, he said, worship God. Revelation 
19, Revelation 22, John went to bow down to him. He said, no, don't worship me. Worship God. Always worship him. Don't worship me. Worship him. I'm just a man. I'm just a son of man here to reveal the son of man. But we should worship the ground. No, you won't find that anywhere in the Bible. You won't find him anywhere saying that. Never going to find it. So he said, he prepared the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Now, how would you, well, I say it like this, in the restoration of the bride tree that was done in that ministry, in this ministry, uh, even turning to the Joshua of our day, the restoration of the bride tree, the word that has been restored, the word that's been, the faith that was restored, the word that's been revealed in this day. You can only worship God, the Lord Jesus told the woman well, in spirit and in truth. You can only worship him in spirit and in truth. So if you're not worshiping God in truth, but only in spirit, then you're not worshiping God. Or at least you're not doing it in a right percentage. I don't know what he accepts as far as that goes. And if you're not worshiping in spirit, only in truth, you're still not doing it right. right. Too many people say, you, you have your intellectuals in the message say, we have this, we have God, and we'll just do it. No move of God until the change. No move of God whatsoever. Then you have the other side. All we want to know is God's in a prophet. That's all we want to know. I'm in the message. God's in a prophet. That's all we want to know. Why did he send him? Right. Why? You'll find all through the Bible talking about those mysteries that to be revealed. That was to be revealed in this day, in this hour. Things that Adam didn't even know that they brought forth in this. What did it do? It brought forth a picture and a proof and a truth of God where you could worship him in truth. In truth. Because you're not just seeing him. It doesn't help you to just see him. You see yourself. He brought you. He redeemed you. He always chose you. What got John, a type of the bride, so excited? He saw him. Yes, I see God. Powerful. I see what God's doing. Powerful. Then he saw that God wanted me. Repair the altar of the Lord is broken down. Not worshiping under a Paul message, under a Wesley message, under a Arrhenius message, under a John Wesley message. You understand? Those were good parts. All went to day. It brought to a fullness. But not under that light of another day. Not under the light of the other day. The proof of the Holy Ghost is walking in the present truth. That's the proof of the Holy Ghost. Not speaking in tongues, but the proof of the Holy Ghost is walking in the present truth of the day. Because God is alive. Amen? Amen. God does not change, but God does progress. As he's built up to this high point that you're in now, he's opened more and more and more of himself so that you could see him and you could worship him. I want to read a, a part to you. <clears throat> just as we stop, I just want that one line there out yeah, of the church age book. Brother Graham said, when the church disbelieves Satan, when the church disbelieves Satan. That means at some point you did believe Satan. You listened to it. You heard what he said. Well, that must be true. He's the one screaming at me nonstop today. It must be true. But when the church disbelieves Satan and believes the Spirit's revelation of the Word, well, that, that actually just shows you a condition. Believe the Spirit's revelation. But I can read it. I can read it page to page, like a newspaper. I can compare it verse to verse. That's not quickness. It must be made alive. It only is made alive by the Holy Ghost. That's what makes it alive and brings it real before you. Disbelieve Satan and believe the Spirit of revelation of the Word. The gates of hell cannot prevail against it. Can't do it. You believe this would be God? Yeah. Right. It's the truth. It cannot prevail. Satan hates truth. And I'm kind of skipping through those paragraphs if you're reading along. He knows that if the people get the true revelation of the true church and what she is, what she stands for, and that she can do the great works, she will be an invincible army. Right. Satan is powerless before you. He is Definitely as thwarted today as when he was stood our Lord Jesus. Definitely as thwarted today. Put that in perspective of your life. Put that in perspective.
He sure changed the future. He's done big with me. Thank you, Lord. It just isn't like, you don't understand that this is a lot of times that you'll find the scripture and you find the prophet using um, different um, um, boxing matches or, or fighting things or races to give you just a, a glimpse or idea of the race or battle that you're in. Be not ignorant concerning his devices, lest he get <coughs> excuse me, an, an, an advantage over you. But it's not in the sense of uh, you have a fighter that was beat up and knocked out by another guy in a previous fight. And then when he gets to you, you might not be the same quality of a fighter as the one that beat him. You with me? Not the same quality of that. So he's backed up to strength. He's healed from the fight. He's recovered from his wounds. And he's ready to go again. It ain't that kind of a fight. No, no. He was so decimated that he should never fight again. Career should be over. Only thing he's still doing, getting in the ring and lying to you. Maybe he has a, you've seen a, in different uh, different places, they'll have a, a little uh, a little statue, a little wall or something standing there, and you can walk behind it and put your head in it. You know, it looks like you, and maybe it's a great big man or big muscle and all these different things, and maybe you only see the face, you don't really see what the body looks like. That's all Satan has done. Walks up looking like he's got shoulders to buy wide and big old biceps, but behind him he's broken, defeated, stomped on. That's right. Right. Stomped on. Yep. But, but look how big that poster is. It ain't real. Right. It ain't real. But it's just big as a mountain. There's a scripture for that. That's right. Get to see. There's a scripture for that. Let's go back to our verse. He repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. So Elijah took 12 stones. He took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob. That's again, it's something very interesting. Unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. I love what Brother Doug said on Wednesday night, that if God had not given him another name, he'd have walked around without a name. Yep. But that man died. That's Jacob right. died. Amen. Jacob died. So I also like, I heard another brother say, in the last few months, anytime you find the scripture, even with Moses, when God was saying, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, talking to his people, to his people, you understand? Otherwise, it'd be called Israel, but to his people, showing them that, look at the failure that Jacob was, look at the sinner that Jacob was, look at the liar and the conman that Jacob, the key word is, was, was, but Israel is his name, but I redeemed, I changed him. So to his people, to comfort you, because Satan tells you all the time, you ain't changed. Ain't no nothing happened to you. You're the same man you were before. No, I'm not. You're a liar. He's a liar. I'm not the same person. I'm not perfect yet, but I'm on the right way. So he comes up and he says, according to the name, well, the Lord said, uh, Israel shall be thy name, <clears throat> the twelve tribes. And with the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about that altar. As great as would contain two measures of seed. Now we shared with you last Sunday about what Ahaz had done, the father of Hezekiah. Now he had seen an altar in a foreign land that was so impressed by this pagan altar that he sent descriptions and dimensions and maybe even drawings back to his people and told them to build an altar just like that to a pagan God. That'd be the name. Now you look at what Elijah's built. He took this and built this thing so specifically and according to the word of the Lord and according to God fulfilled promises up to the day. You understand? God fulfilled promises. What's being done is not a coincidence. Then there's 12 stones. It's not a coincidence. God keeps his word. So fast forward back to where Abraham standing there. He told Abraham, and Isaac, I see, will be. That would be named to go, if Isaac, that's your heir. If Isaac had never been born, there standing here, there would be no 12 stones. There'd be no reason for that. All of this is showing you that God keeps his word. You're literally standing and worshiping on the promise of God. Yep. Not the promise of a man. Not the idea. Not the whole thing. But what God said and what God did. Now we ain't even got up to our day yet. We got way more proof coming toward our day than just back 
So he built this altar in the name of the Lord, in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about this altar, as great as would contain two measures of seed. So, again, nothing for nothing. You've got a beautiful altar according to the word of the Lord. And now he's throwing this weird little ditch around it. Strange looking little ditch around it. Nobody ever dug a ditch around the altar before. This is odd. Why would you do this? I want to prove to you that he's greater than any element. Any element. See, he's going to destroy the world once with water. The God that destroyed the earth with water is going to prove himself once again. Elijah has said he's the God that answered my fire. He done told them that. Right. And all the years the people were standing there listening. Everybody gathered there. They had to. Stand there. So you're thinking this weird ditch. What's the point? To show you, even in this, that the one that destroyed the world before will answer again. So he's built this trench around it as great as it contained two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order. He put it in order. See, I like gun firewood. And this word verse means something to me for a reason. So you can take a, a dump truck or a trailer or whatever it is, and you can throw the wood in there, just chunking it in any which way, and it won't get neatly stacked. You can't get as much, in my opinion, that's debatable because I've had people argue that you can't get as much on the load as you could if it was neatly stacked. Right. You can just get heaped up on there. But if you're perfectly stacked, everything's perfectly in order. Nothing out of this place. You still with me? Because there's a purpose to your life. You have conditions and things in your life to live for God. Things that he requires. Your life must be in order. Your life and your heart must be submitted to him in every form and fashion. You can't say, well, I'm going to keep this over myself. I'm going to hide this part. He doesn't really require that. You won't be in order. And if you're not in order, then you're out. You've got to keep it alive. If you're not in order, you've got to keep it alive. Your vertebrates out. Something's not working right. You understand? We've talked about that a lot. It must be a perfect straight quote. It must be in order for it to work. Because again, we talked about uh, people being in a church and they say and they worship in this same God, but God never moves for their life. They can't get healed. They can't get a headache healed. Couldn't get a toe healed. The God that ain't scared of cancer that said to a prophet, if you can get them to believe, not even cancer will stay in the Lord for your way. Get them to believe. Well, now wait a minute. Now, I was this and I was that. No, no, no. That's not what he said. If he can get you to believe. But I did this. Not disputing that. But if you can get them to believe, then not even cancer could stand before his prayer. Yeah. See, that's, that's very powerful. Very, very powerful. See, God keeps his word. I understand, again, you always got to cover the negative part of the book. Satan beats you up every different way. That there is a thing of chasing in your life, and if you've got something to make right, you need to make it right. Don't go one more second. Well, you don't need that big of a deal. It's not, no, no, you make it right right now. You make your heart right between you and God, and there's nothing standing between you and Him. There's nothing standing between His promise to you. Not one thing. There's no reason you should not be able to be you. No reason. His promise leaves no error for it. That if you do this, he does this. Every time. Well, well no, that, that well ain't from God. That well, that but, that ain't from God. That's all the devil. That's all the enemy. That's not God. His promise to you are yea and amen. <clears throat> he put the word in order. And then he cut the bullet in pieces and laid him, the, the boy, had to be a male. Laid him on the wood. Laid him on the wood and said, Fill four barrels of water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. And he said, Do it the second time. And they did it the second time. What? It. They did it the second time. And he said, Do it the third time. And they did it the third time. And they did it, you understand? They did it the third time. Three things. That's very powerful. Didn't the prophet just say he had three bulls? And the water ran round about the altar. And he filled the trench also with water. He filled the trench also with water. 
And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. Now your Bible no doubt has that italicized as well. See, Elijah is not even sitting over them at 6 a.m. going, you've got to be done by eating sacrifice. He's not telling them that. You've got to be done by 9 o'clock, whatever it should have been, eating sacrifice. He knows God just showed him my vision that it will happen at this time. So he stands and waits. And then it just happens to culminate right at the time of the evening sacrifice. What a coincidence. Just, but, but the heat is raging, no doubt. No doubt. He's got it all in control. Yes, but it's pushing God's timetable back. Who are you talking about? But it, 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 it's out of his hand. It's out of his control. Who are you talking about? Every second is in control. I've heard so many people over here, even the message long well, the, the people have left the message. You have the group that left in 77. You've got all the people here as well. This and this and this and this and they just give up the lead. It doesn't matter. It'll take as long as it takes. Right. As long as it takes. If it had happened in 77, I'd never be born. Some of us would not have been born. Wouldn't be here. I had to be born. You had to be born. You understand? You had to be born. You were predestinated to receive the Holy Ghost in this day, in this hour, in this light that we're living in. I believe that. You might think you're crazy, but I believe that. <clears throat> so, got the altar built. It's stacked right. It's thoroughly, permanently saturated. A lot like God did when He soaked the earth the first time. Didn't they say that not even a mountain was found? Mountain, could ever be Kilimanjaro, Everest, uh, Rocky, Smoky. Not one mountain could be found because he's so thorough in his job, he washed it clean. And now here in a smaller type, you have this prophet on the same proven of that same God who's the same yesterday in Noah's day, is the same God in this Elijah's day. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. <clears throat> that Elijah the prophet came near and said, I look how he's changing. Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel. Everybody's hearing him speak. He's not talking about Jacob's flaws. He's not talking about Jacob's sin. He's not talking about Jacob's mistakes. That man's dead. So right now, for in the ears of the entire nation, of everyone that's there to hear, he said his name is Israel. Amen. Israel. Redeemed. The Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day, this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things in thy word. Why would the point have to be for him to work into that paragraph that I am thy servant? Why would he have to work that in? Why would that have to be said? That's before a public forum that I am nothing, he is everything. He is God. I work for him. He called him Lord. No one can call him Lord but by the Holy Ghost. He called him Lord. You understand? That's where all power is. That's who God is. Nothing of my own. You'll find over in the book of Acts, we missed that earlier, jumping around, but it's right before we read earlier how Herod had died. Herod the Tetrarch. These men said, after he gave a speech or whatever, it said it sounds like the voice of an angel or the voice of a God. And he didn't say, no, that's not. And instantly, instantly, he died. Overcome with worms on the inside out. Eat the worms. All because he didn't say, whoa, stop, 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 stop. He probably stood there and said, yeah, I am. That's not the response of Christ. The response of Christ is he was God. He was God. What's the way up? It's that. The way up is always down. He is God. He is God. <laughs> hear me, O oh Lord, hear me. That this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. What will the prophet of our day do? Turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, hearts of the children to the fathers. Has turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell. Just like that. Just like that. John chapter 4. Then the fire of the Lord fell, and consumed the burnt sacrifice, and the wood, and the stones, and the Dust. The dust. <laughs> He's thorough. And he licked up the water that was, again, that word is italicized, was in the trench. Ain't there no more? Ain't there no more? 
gone. He took it away. And here's the response of the people. When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is the God, the Lord, He is the God. The Lord, He is the God. He is the God. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. What a mighty God. Still fulfills his word all these years later and keeps his word. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Living God in our day now. Therefore, see, we have this ministry as we have received mercy. Therefore, see, we have this ministry. Again, words like how be it heretofore and therefore. See, we have this ministry. As we have received mercy, we faint not. In the days of the Son of Man, keep that in mind as we read that, in the days when the Son of Man is revealed, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. Renounced, put away, wants no part, no love of the world, nothing to do with it, not walking in craftiness. You know that craftiness. Craftiness is trying to twist things. I'm going to be crafty about it. I'm going to tell you the truth, but I'm going to twist it. Well, this is how it really happens. That's not the truth. And at any point to attempt to deceive, even to intentionally leave something out to make you look better or make something uh, thought a certain way. I've been guilty of that before. Like I told you, I used to be a liar. I ain't a liar no more. No craftiness, no dishonesty, none of those things, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. They're not talking about you taking a almanac an encyclopedia, a dictionary, or any other historical book and trying to misquote it or twist it for your means. They're talking about taking this and trying to put chains on someone and to keep them from the promise of God. Using it deceitfully. Deceitfully means a lie. To deceive is a lie. So if it's not truth, it's a lie. Is that not interesting? But, 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 by manifestation of the truth, manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Well, I don't care what that person thinks. I don't care. I got nothing to do with them. What did, what did Cain tell the Lord? Am I my brother's keeper? Was that the response of the, of the beast? Was that the response? Am I my brother's keeper? Right. You, I, you, I ain't got to listen to you. I ain't got to open you those things. That's not the, that's not the spirit of Christ. But if our gospel is here, if it be here, it is here to them that are lost. In whom the little g, the little g of this world had blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God. Look at that again. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Blinded them so they could not see the light. So for the man that's blind, he's just completely blind. Can't even see colors whatsoever. You stand in the midst of the sun outside of the heat on his face, he would not believe you that the sun was shining. But you did, but but you did. Nope, I don't believe it, I don't see it. Done in this sense, so that they could not see him. Who is the image? Who is the image? See, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, that you hid these things from the eyes of the wise and prudent, but will reveal them unto babes such as we learn. See, again, the way things are worded, it, it, it tells you how to get there. It shows you how to approach it. Well, I know everything. I know the Bible. I have it memorized. I have the message memorized. I know Will said anybody else. No one else can quote it like that again. None of those things. Can anyone teach you? Well, the Bible says we not have any man need to teach us. Twisting. Right. That, it's that heart that says, Lord, speak to me. Amen. Amen. Speak right. to me. I don't know everything. I've got a lot left to learn. Lord, speak to me. He says, that's who he can speak to. That's who he can do. That kind of a heart. <clears throat> we preach not ourselves. <clears throat> we preach not ourselves but Christ Jesus the Lord. And ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded, God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. Again, we want to make 
sure your mind is, understands who we're talking about, that he spoke, let it be, and it actually happened. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. See, Paul, in the previous chapter, was telling you about seeing through glass darkly. Not really the Lord holding him face to face. The seals had not come off yet. Paul was preaching to them from that day. Paul was not talking about when I was carried into the future like John was. He got blessed. He's telling you right now in the Ephesian church age, right now, with the light that's available, right now, with what little bit we see, we see in the last part. That is not the revelation of this hour. Right, amen. That is not the revelation of this hour. Amen. The seal will come off the book. The Lamb has taken the book. He's come forth. The revelation of some man is here, and you can see him face to face. The glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You can't even contact. You can't even imagine. You can't even let your mind perceive God without the Lord Jesus Christ. Why was there a need of the Lord? What was the need of it? So that we could perceive him. So that we could grasp him. So that we could understand and have something for our feeble, finite minds to hold on to. The way you do it is in that name. In that name. The face of Jesus Christ. Now here's how it's easy to get things common. It's very easy. Say it again. If he can't keep you away from the truth of God, if he can't keep you away from a promise of God, he has no problem pushing you over the edge with it. Pushing you off the cliff with it. This is how this is worded. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. This treasure. Now wait a minute. But it, 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 we've got to understand that the treasure he's talking about is seeing the face of Jesus Christ. That's this treasure, and it's wrapped up in an earthen vessel. In an earthen vessel. <clears throat> brother Wayne was here a, a couple months ago. He was telling me and some, some of the brothers about the, the uh, the word, the phrase, hypostatic union. That hypostatic union, you can look it up, Google it, 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 it'll really bless your heart. Uh, and it goes back to the Greek lexicon, and they're talking about the condescension from God to Jesus, that logos, that how that, what it describes, they had to create the word to where that it would be something that would describe a, uh, a relationship with all God and all man. They had to Create that word, hypostatic union between all God, because God can fit, all of God can fit in one body. Right. But he was the fullness of God in body. Yes. So is the scripture true or not? The scripture is always true. Yes. So how could this possibly be that he could not be all God, he could not be all man, but he was the fullness of God in body? You understand it's the same thing as you are. Yes, he was born perfect without sin, but when you come, he might he did not bypass his theophany like we did. He come with it. I understand that. But it's the same thing of the condescension to his bride today. God going in man. All God did all man. You know, it's a redeemed body. It's a redeemed soul. It's a redeemed spirit. And that same one who was so perfect that they couldn't even before and any beast that wandered upon the mountain, they had to be killed. Any or something like this. Any flesh. Any nature. Any flesh, any nature that wandered up on the mountain when he came down upon that mountain, they had to be thrust through. This was under the curse of sin. Had to be killed instantly because of sin. In this day, in this redemption, you gain access to the holies of holies where you're not just told to go, but you're ushered into his presence. In Revelation chapter 4, I, John, looked to behold the door open in heaven, and his voice said, come up higher. He didn't say, I'd like to go up there. No, he was told, come into what you were created for. This is where you were created to live in his presence, in the holiest of holies, in heavenly places. And John was a type of you. Don't you love that? He was a type of you. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We're keeping things in perspective. This is the power of God, not the power of Sam Parker. Now, you understand your own stuff. You've watched your life change. Like I've seen my life change. You've watched your prayers going from being hit and miss, things you asked for, to now that they're starting to be answered more and more repeatedly. And 
is not coincidental. But you're watching your prayer getting answered. Well, why don't you change how you pray? You change how you ask. You're not, Lord, I would really like a new car. I would really like a new job. I would really like to these nice clothes. You know, I, mean, I need a Ferrari. You're not asking silly things like that. You have a need. Lord, I need this car to do this job. I need these things to pay my bills. You promised me this. You understand? I need clothes. I don't have to have Gucci. I don't have to have a nicer suit. I'm fine with standing here and clothes and praying. I don't have a problem with that. But you understand how you change. You're not puffed up with love of the world anymore. You have a different desire. Your heart is now wired to where you're praying really differently. And most of the time, it ain't for you. Isn't that amazing? The prayer ain't for you. I, I, I saw something, and it kind of clicked to me in 2 Kings when Elisha died. You'll remember a, a testimony I think both Perry Green shared <coughs> about um, they were praying for them out hunting in the woods. I don't remember exactly where it was at. But Brother Brown, and he told them, he confided them that he had a... Uh, I remember it was a sprained ankle or a his leg or something that had been that way for days and had not gotten any better whatsoever. And he had been living everywhere in those mountains for days at least. They said, you have prayed for hundreds of thousands of people. You have put your hands on them and whatever they had went away. Yet you were still struggling with that. And he told them, the gift is not for me. The gift is for you. So they laid their hands on him God healed. So you go back to 2 Kings. The Bible states it this way. When Elisha died from the disease wherewith he died. When Elisha died from the disease wherewith he died. I'm talking about the same Elisha that that Shunammite woman was given a child from the dead because she was barren in her old age and then that child actually did die again and he laid his body upon him and he was brought back to life. The same Elisha that these poor folks had lost their axe in. You with me? And said, we don't own it. We can't afford to buy another one. We had to buy it. If we had money of our own, we would have bought it and not borrowed it. But we can't even replace what we lost. Can you help us? Same one died from a disease. Where would he die? But, short amount of time later, these other uh, Israelites are going to bury a friend of theirs. This, this band of Moabite soldiers comes to like, come upon them. They got scared, shot the dead man on top of the other dead man, and that man ain't dead no more, and now he's running away with it. Wow. But again, the disease from wherewith he died. This is why you have a body of Christ. Yes, that's right. Amen. This is why you have a body of Christ. I shared that with you on Wednesday night about that song that indicated to Bethany Son about the song Rescue. He said, I will send out an army to find you. I will send out an army. Now, and I, I covered that. I, I want to say that again just so you understand what I mean by that. I tend to talk fast sometimes. I don't really make my, my, my thought clear. <clears throat> With Elijah and Elisha and Dothan, that Gehazi was falling apart and Gehazi's heart was failing for fear. You see those soldiers. We're two. They're them. We can't do that. And Elisha says, God, open his eyes. Just open his eyes. And he opened his eyes, and he saw all these fields and mountains filled with armies of God everywhere they looked, as far as the eye could see. And it was enough of a vision that Elisha said, that the Gehazi said, wow, way more for us than for them. Way more. You realize only one-third of the angels left. Right. Only one-third. Not to be simple, but in one-third, you must have three threes. So if one-third fell, there's still two-thirds that did not fall. But that part's kind of pointless. Those angels in the chariots of fire didn't do nothing for Elisha and Gehazi. Someone else did. See, the angels had no problem to kill anyone. But God is love, and God is mercy, and God is grace. You understand that? Because you find also in the scripture, these men turn on themselves different men and kill each other in the night. We thought no one was, and they turn on each other. God can do anything he wants. But in this type, in this thing, you find all of a sudden that God spikes a blind. And Elisha is able to lead them almost by the hand into the king's uh, of the kingdom of the, the area, whatever it was. Walked them right in there. And the king of that city said, well, should we kill them? Should we kill them? We can kill them easy. And he said, no. Keep them and let them go. Give them some drink. Give them some meat. Let them go. But there are enemies. These won't be here anymore. So I just, 
That's just, that's just amazing. And the thing about that is, the one that fights for you, again, one death angel to erase this planet and just you know, see erase it all. That's one. And there's two thirds more out there. So if an extra 200 plus million people were released upon the pride, upon the people of God, upon this world, an extra 200 million, I don't know if that means there was 250 more, 550 more, I don't understand, you know, so I don't know that number. The point being is, it's still in the but have you looked outside? Have you watched the news? Have you seen these things? Amen. Right. How do I know this for sure? Because someone that, that cannot lie made a promise. And this is what he said. You ready? Greater is he that's in you than he is anywhere out there. Anywhere out there. That is the living God. Let's have our musicians come this morning. None can stay the same as None can stay the same. I want to. I want, to, is this, is this coming up? I want to read this to you. Paul goes on to say about this treasure that's hidden up. And he does go ahead and make sure you understand that your life in a fire of enemies. You're, you're going to have tests. You're going to have troubles. All those things. And he says this in verse 8. We're troubled on every side. That you were not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Wait a minute. You're persecuted by someone but you're not forsaken by someone else. Who is not forsaking you? You're cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in your body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live, this is what he, all he wants is you. You stand up feet this morning. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also that the life also of Jesus might be manifest in our mortal flesh that proves that he's alive. How do I know that he's a redeemer? He redeemed me. How do I know that he's a healer? He's healed me. How do I know that he's here right now? Then I can feel him moving in my life.
so merciful, so kind, that each and every day, Lord, every to every hour, to every minute of the day, you keep making yourself known. And I love you. I'm only going to be staying. I don't ever want to get caught up. I don't want to get caught up for it. I want to stay long in your presence. So that's why I want to live. I believe when that's when I was created to live. For each of myself and my brothers and sisters, well, that's our desire. To stay constantly in that secret in the place of the people. To soak in up for all of your life and in the world that you're truly to And I we appreciate you, Lord, for, for saving us and for choosing us before the foundation of the world. We thank you for being patient with us, Lord. Made plenty of mistakes in my life, made plenty of times when I fell flat on my face, Lord, but you and your mercy is forgiven. Lord. And I pray you, Lord, and I thank you with all of my heart. I pray for our brothers and sisters that we go our separate ways. I pray, Lord, that you will continue to be so near to you, Lord, that you will let this anointing, this presence that's in this room right now, follow them home, Lord. Go with them in your car, Lord, God. Wherever they go, let it just saturate all that they are, Lord. Have your way in our lives. For our brothers and sisters that have a need for today, Lord, whether it be a touch of healing, or whether we dismiss back, Lord, I love that, brother. I pray that you would touch him right now. I know Satan is trying to use his back and his shoulders against him to try to tear him down and try to weaken him more. But you've got a use for that brother's life and you have a will for him. Satan, I rebuke you. I curse you. I come against you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. We have brothers and sisters in this church that need to touch you. Look at Webster. Brother Hector Orlando says, You sure are hearts that they need to touch you. I pray right now that you would go there and you would move to that behalf. You would move to that need, Lord, and you would make the be with us as we go our separate ways. We love you so very, very much.